All right, thanks to everybody tuning in. Uh, my name is Peter Cordy, hosting Anointed Live. I'm here with Libertarian candidate for governor, Peter Rohrman. Uh, Peter, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, everybody. Hey, this is Peter Rohrman. I'm the Libertarian candidate for governor of New Jersey. Looking forward to the election coming up. A little bit about me. A lifelong resident of New Jersey, spent a lifetime in service to my fellow man, spent about eight years in the United States Marine Corps as a rifleman, spent a significant amount of time volunteering my time for my community as in volunteer, um, volunteer firefighter, volunteer athletic coach, etc. Uh, also spent a lot of time while I was going to school at Rutgers Newark as a planetarium instructor. We were doing a lot of outreach shows for the children in Newark. Uh, learned a lot, had the opportunity to work with a lot of teachers in Newark, and uh, it was uh, it was enjoyable. I had a good time doing that. Wow, what an honor it is to be able to interview you. Just very honorable, you know, a Marine veteran, volunteer okay. fighter. Give yourself some time to get to know me a little bit better, and then that. The <laughs> <laughs> libertarian. That's an honor in itself. So, uh, speaking of which, what to you is your most important issue that you want to tackle if you're elected? All right, let's talk about campaign themes. Mm -hmm. The entire theme of my campaign is about personal happiness. Right now in our nation, we have an incredible amount of divide. This divide between the left and the right, between the citizenry and its government, where we see we, we place our police officers right in the middle. My campaign is all about happiness. When we look at the Democrat Republican parties, they're what are called authoritarian parties. They're all about control. They want to remove one of your freedoms to enhance one of their own. And they go back and forth. And what happens is you continue with this struggle. People become upset. They become hostile. Let's look at basic human psychology. If you're a 10-year-old, you're at home, mom's making dinner, and uh, you say, mom, I want an ice cream cone. Says no, right? You can't have it because you're going to spoil your dinner. She's saying no because it's good for you. Now, that creates hostility, angst, you're angry at mom, mom, go away. That hostility does not vanish when you're 25 years old. Whatever you want as a 25-year-old, if you want to buy a drag, a drag car, if you want to smoke marijuana, if you want to buy an automatic weapon, whatever it is that you want to have or exercise, when you're told you can't do it, it creates hostility. My campaign is all about removing that hostility. The Libertarian Party platform is all about personal freedom, peace, tolerance, and that's what I'm trying to bring forth to New Jersey. We are about we are consistently bringing freedom across the board. We don't care what your freedom is, what you want to exercise. Go ahead, have at it. Even if it's bad for you, we want you to have the freedom. So long as you don't harm anyone else. When you start exercising whatever it is you like to do and it's harming other people, that's where we draw a line in the sand. We want you to be happy. When we remove all this hostility and this angst, we can come together as a people together again. My campaign is all about unifying people under freedom, and no other candidate is doing that. They're all trying to pit A against B in hopes they can come up with a larger voter block. Believe it or not, I, although my name isn't out there as much as the other candidates is, are, my my whole platform is about peace, about individual freedom. So that's where it's going. Like When you talk about the biggest issue, it's your happiness. Now, there are planks. There's everything I'm, I have on my campaign that branch up to it. We could talk about my tax plan. We could talk about age of majority. We could talk about school choice, all these different things. We could talk about guns, marijuana, anything you want to talk about, we can. But everything branches up to your happiness. Right. Okay. So that's that actually answers a lot of questions that I had right there. Um, so I think let's focus on first and foremost, the tax plan, because I know that's a big thing going on in uh, the major, the two parties where Phil Murphy wants to raise taxes, Kim Guadano wants to lower taxes, and you have Trump who has this tax plan to lower taxes, but then we're finding out now that there might be this 46% tax bracket on, on the super rich. Yeah. Which raises... Whatever Trump mm -hmm. is doing is going to be out of my control as a governor, so let's just right. leave him out of the conversation for now. Right. Let's look at uh, Murphy's tax plan. Let's... Hmm. He wants to raise it by $1.3 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where are you get the money from? How many times has that question been posted? Where... Answer the question. Uh, Kim Guadano's tax plan, there really is nothing to it. Her tax plan is she's trying to appeal to the property tax owner by saying, if you cannot afford more than 5% of your income to pay for your personal, for your income, for um, your property tax, we'll have the state kick in. That's socialism. 
That's having me or you paying somebody else's property taxes. That's not fair. Right. My tax plan is more than a tax plan. It's a, it's a reinvention of government. It's called fiscal democracy. And here, I'll give you all, all, all of it. Now, when the framers of our Constitution came up with the concept of our government, it was innovative. It was never thought of before, a, a totally free society. They wanted the people to be free. They wanted to give them a republic exercised as a true democracy. But as you know, a true democracy even today is untenable. You can't have a million or so people all debating the law, trying to figure out what appropriate funds. It just doesn't work. Okay? So what they did was they gave us a representative democracy where we elect representatives to conduct business on our behalf. Well, over the past uh, 200 years or so, we found out that it's not working too well. All these elective representatives have figured ways around this freedom to benefit themselves. We have, in fact, traded that one tyrant 3,000 miles away for 3,000 tyrants one mile away. Under my plan, we will be moving appropriations away from irresponsible legislators and putting it into the taxpayers' hands. Now, under this plan, that nobody's ever thought of this before, nobody's ever put this together as an idea this creates a fourth branch of government. Right now, you have your judicial, your legislative, your executive, but this creates a fourth branch of government where the individual taxpayer, the person, can decide what is worthy of his tax, his or her tax dollars. If you like your local school district, you could put your money in there. If oh. you like your county police department, you could put some money in there. Mm -hmm. If you think there's too many bumps in the road, you could put some money into the infrastructure program. If, uh, let's say, um, if you say, let's say, like, no matter what side of abortion you're on. Now, abortion is a very hot issue. It doesn't matter what side you're on. It's something that ignites people. If you're a Christian or if you're a Catholic, you can appreciate the fact, well, it doesn't matter what side you're on. Christians or Catholics, they are forced by gunpoint to provide tax dollars to the state, the county, whatnot, and they take that money and they put it into Planned Parenthood. Now, these people are forced by gunpoint to sin. Right. Whatever side of the fence you're on an abortion, you can appreciate the fact that somebody is being forced to do something they don't want to do, and it's against their moral beliefs. Now, under my tax plan, they don't have to fund Planned Parenthood. They can pull their money out of it, and they can fund whatever they want. And it seems on the other side, the pro-choice people, they can say, hmm, you know, we, like, we need to have our eugenics program, so let, let's continue to fund this Planned Parenthood thing. Right. Now, my plan, it's comprehensive. It takes a lot to explain it. Right now, under the many different avenues that the state, the county, municipal government charge you taxes for, it's about 30% of your income. When you look at your property tax, when you look at your sales tax, gas tax, uh, all types of vice tax, corporate taxes, when you add it all up, it's approximately 30% of your income. That's not including the federal government. That's just state, county, municipal government. That's a lot of money. People don't realize how much they're paying to the state, county, municipal governments only because it comes from so many different areas. You go to work all week. They take it out of your paycheck at the end of the week. You go to buy your kid a toy. They take it out again. Oh, you want to buy a beer? Oh, there's another one they take out, right? They keep streaming it from you, and you don't realize where it's coming from. Under my tax plan, all of these taxes are eliminated and simplified into one single tax. Mm -hmm. We eliminate property tax. Yes, everyone, please listen. You can eliminate property tax. It can be done. We're conditioned to believe from generations that it has to be there. It does not have to be there. Eliminate property tax, eliminate sales tax, gas tax, eliminate everything. Even vehicle registration fees are gone. They're out the window. Replace with fiscal democracy. It's an income tax. You raise it to 10% with a constitutional amendment with the added bonus of you get to decide where to put that money into. You get to decide what to fund, what to defund. I get so many questions on the campaign trail. People, like, my mindset is totally different from Democrats, Republicans. Their whole mindset, they spend careers like Kim Guadano, uh, any other, like, even like, not so much Trump, but like career politicians, they spend an entire lifetime educating themselves how to put Band-Aids on a patient that's just about dead. Mm -hmm. I don't waste my time thinking about how to do that. I spend my time, focus my efforts on how to make it better. Where can I take this society to get us to the next step? So when you talk about like people come to me and say, hey, Pete, what programs would you cut? I'm not cutting anything. You're cutting anything. You're cutting anything you want. People like, and they ex I explain to them, they, like, they love the idea. The more people hear my tax idea, they love it. So that's where my tax plan is. Uh, I don't know if you have any callers or so. Maybe they can call in and ask us about it. But like, oh, uh, that's not that's not functional. Just <laughs> right. yeah, it's functional tomorrow. We'll get that. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, okay. So regarding um, the programs that you cut, so your tax plan basically says that they'll they'll take like a 10% flat tax 
out of my salary, correct? And no other taxes. Th there wouldn't be property tax, nope. estate tax, death tax, none Gone. of that. And basically what you're saying is that I choose what programs I want to fund. So whatever's not getting funded, well, you don't have to control any of that. You don't need to be that, that tyrant in control, cutting what is and what isn't. It becomes we vote with our dollar, right? Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. It's voting with your dollars. Okay. So now regarding the whole um, 3,000 3, tyrants one mile away, um, I see on your your Instagram. By the way, tell um, our listeners what your uh, Instagram is. Oh, uh, Instagram. Okay. I, I don't know the address. I've got some people that are handling it. I, you know, I should get that for you. But my Facebook is uh, Roman for governor or so like that. You can just search me. Right. If you search me on Instagram, you search me on, on Facebook, you can probably find it. Uh, well, um, one of the things you had was talking about uh, how you're not funded by Goldman Sachs. You will not take any campaign uh, donations from Goldman Sachs and uh, and any, you know, the major PACs and, you know, philanthropists like George Soros, which I'm not sure how you feel about him, but I'm not a fan of Nazi collaborators myself. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, so we, expand on that. We, uh, we wouldn't take donations from people that would hold us to or the word of whatever it is. Right. Uh, but at the same time, they're not interested in giving us any money either. And I'm glad for that because uh, now I never have to worry about dealing with like, oh, somebody's going to you know, come up with a, a $2 million pack to, uh, to fund me and get me in there. Um, I'm not worried about it. I'm running a campaign that I'm very proud of. Uh, my team is very proud of the job we're doing. And come election day, win or lose, you know, We'll have at least done our job. Like, our first job is to win the election. If we can't win it, our secondary job is to spread the word of liberty, right. to get people wary of government, and to give people the, the, to notify more people, to educate more people that there's more than just two choices. You don't have to vote for the lesser of two evils. There's plenty of third party people out there that represent you. And the ironic thing about it is that the Libertarian Party really represents most of the voters. When you look yeah. at the, the, the statistics of, of voter registrations, most people are not affiliated with any party. And depending on what election is, which way they sway. When you present them the libertarian philosophy of peace, tolerance, freedom, small government, they love it. And they embrace it. Every time I talk to someone, they just they fall in love with it. They register libertarian. They start voting our way. And that's my job. Win it, number one. Can't win it. Make the party larger. Spread the word. Right. That's, that's great right there. And... Uh I, I follow up with that, um, that our politicians aren't always looking out for our best interest. Never. Their <laughs> best interest. The Never. The interest of, say, George Soros, who's giving them the money, or the Goldman Sachs, how they want them to vote on certain bills or implement certain things. And we'll see that at the top, the Republicans and the Democrats, they, they are very similar. Like uh, John McCain even voting against uh, Trump and his whole repeal and replace Obamacare. Meanwhile, he's been totally against Obamacare the whole time. He better be careful when he starts going against his own party. Oh, you know, yeah. As an example, let's look at Bob Menendez. Mm -hmm. right? Bob Menendez went against the Obama administration. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And when he did that, that's when they unleashed that nuclear bomb and that investigation. Quite frankly, everybody in the Senate, they do exactly what he does. Okay, right. they, they sell, they peddle their influence oh, yeah. for whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Now, Democrats will not unleash these bombs on Republicans and vice versa because it falls under the laws of mutual annihilation. You know, like once you start that nuclear war, there's no stopping it. But there's nothing stopping them from gassing their own to keep them in line. Right. That's exactly what happened Bob Menendez. McCain better be a little bit careful because like, oh, yeah. the same thing could happen. Do you, I, I don't think President Trump would have any, any hesitation at all on unleashing some kind of like, crazy investigation on him. Right. Well, the thing with that is, you know, uh, the old Republican Party is being destroyed. It's being taken over by people with kind of like libertarian ideas. Like Austin ah. Peterson became a Republican to, yep. vote to, uh, to go in the Senate. And he's looking pretty good. I, I, I support him very much. Uh, I supported him against Gary Johnson in the, uh, the libertarian primaries. Did you, you weren't at the, at the uh, convention, were you? No, I wish yeah. I was. Oh, it was a great time. Yeah. It was, yeah. It you was were really at nice the time. LNC? Yeah, it nice. uh, was in Orlando last year. Nice. Did you support uh, Gary Johnson? No, Gary Johnson was the, the last guy I was supporting. Same, <laughs> same. I was. I met fan. Gary plenty of times. Mm -hmm. He's a very nice man. He looks I, like a nice guy. He, he is. He's great. Um, but I didn't think that he represented my values. Like I, I was more of a, a strong-hearted libertarian. He's kind of like a like a small L libertarian almost. Yeah. Like, he's a nice guy. He was, he was a good pick. But like, if you think about it, like him, oh, I don't want to mention the name uh, B W. But the <laughs> 
him and his his running mate, they had a lot of executive experience, and like that appealed to a lot of people out there. Right. Like like okay, these are the only two with executive experience. Mm-hmm. So and they did help the party a little bit. They did hinder the party, they but they wrote like, it in they, votes. They they grew, grew it. it. Grew yes, it. they <laughs> grew <laughs> it. Um, I was supporting John McAfee. I loved him too. You know, like I, I really love John. I met Did him a few times. Did you know his border policy with uh, the drones being instead of having the actual physical Trump wall, he had the policy that he wanted to implement with actual like drone surveillance of an like an electronic wall. Did you Did you know about that? I had no idea he was pitching that. I didn't hear that yeah. once in a whole campaign. I loved campaign. it. I Never invested heard it. in his company too. It was great. Yeah, I, I love that guy. I was supporting John until about like halfway through the convention or so. It, it seemed like. Uh, John had um, maybe lost interest in running. Um, I don't know. I thought he would have been a great presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. He would have, I think he would have grown the party more than Gary Johnson because he's known worldwide. Everybody knows his name. Okay. McAfee, like, right. he's the, such a brilliant technological oh my mind. Goodness. He's, he's, he's brilliant. Like, mm-hmm. He's not one of those people that's just so brilliant, just doesn't really fit in with other people. Like, right. you, you're the top Ahead of 1%. His time. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, I supported him. Um, uh, Daryl Perry. I don't know, did, you, did you take notice of him? Daryl Perry from New Hampshire? I, I saw the debates. I, me- I remember him. I love Daryl. Right. I do. I love this guy. His He is so towards the anarchy side of the party. Yeah. And. I sympathize with that. Though. Okay. I, I wouldn't say that I'm an, an, an anarchist in any way, but I, I would sympathize with them uh, ideologically and in, in some policies yeah. as well. Yeah. We need the anarchists. Yeah, we, we definitely them. do because yeah. they are the anchor of this party, mm-hmm. right? Now you have people that are small L libertarians. You have moderates like myself, and then you have like the anarchists. Right. Well, let's define anarchists because I'm sure a lot of the the, the listeners out there are gonna say. Oh, anarchy! What is this like? Setting fire to the streets, like Antifa? <laughs> like what? What is this? So let's let's define anarchists. Okay, to to me, anarchy is an almost utopian society where everybody gets along. We all help each other build the road. You know, we we stand together. We build, build the this roads. school together. And we put brick and mortar together, and like we all get along fine. We're human beings. We mm-hmm. all different opinion. All right, a true anarchy society just will never fly. Like, but the as getting back to like the anarchists as being the anchor, anytime someone comes up with a statement like you know maybe we should support this or, you know a- a- X for for this and, and like the anarchists say uh, no that's not part of the platform and they draw us back to where right. the anchor should be, right. and we need them to keep a mean. If the anarchists ever break off and form their own party, it would be extremely detrimental to the libertarian party because what will happen is the mean will move more towards the small L libertarian side. Mm-hmm. We'll have more Democrats, more Republicans right. running the party. Like Gary Johnson. Because r- right now, the party really is controlled by the mean, the, the moderate libertarian. People that believe in small government, and believe in government, but believe in small government. Mm-hmm. If anarchists left, it would be like, shift more towards socialism. And we wouldn't be any better than Democrats or Republicans. Yeah. It'd be more so, like Jill Stein, the Green Party almost. She blocked me on Twitter, by the way. Jill Stein did? She blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> yep. Why? I never What'd tweeted on her. I'm a big libertarian. I spread my ideas. She doesn't like those ideas. Really? She's against free speech? No. Oh, no. The, the, no. Oh, yeah. And okay, you know I point None of them like it. Uh, on my Facebook, mm-hmm. there are plenty of people that chime in with negative comments about me. Right. And I let it go. Yeah. As long as... I didn't There's even mention her, though. Not once did I mention her by I, name. If someone's bad-mouthing one of my policies, mm-hmm. I let it go. I just I want that. I want to see the debate ensue. Right. Sometimes step into it. I can't right. step in all the time. But it's uh, I appreciate freedom of speech. Like mm-hmm. yesterday. Yesterday, I was at the governor's mansion, and I was the guest of honor, and I did a speech right in the backyard. It was, uh, it was for the Marine Corps birthday bash. Nice. Um, and I'm a politician, can't keep my mouth shut, so it was like slightly politically charged. Right. And about 90% of the people that were there really appreciated the fact that they had somebody who was running for governor in front of them. There's about 450 people in attendance or so. At the end of the event, everybody expressed their gratitude for having me there except for one person. She was extremely upset that I was speaking of politics at a military event. I'm like, excuse me, ma'am. Militarism is the extension of politics. You understand that? Okay. This is not a non-political event. It's the enforcer. Right. This is the enforcement arm. Now, she was very upset and... Somebody said to me, oh, don't worry about it. I'm like, no, I do worry about her. This is, she is allowed to come up to me and express her, her concern with me speaking out about politics when she thinks I shouldn't. 
I appreciate that. I want this woman to be able to have that freedom of speech. Have the because the reason why I, I'm in love with the idea of freedom of speech is because it presents to us an open marketplace for ideas. The second you start squashing ideas, even if they're bad ideas, the second you start squashing ideas, then the better ideas cannot rise to the top. It creates an open marketplace for ideas. And I will listen to anybody's opinion who's contrary to mine and allow them to at least try to convince me every time. The second you close down your mind to debate, the second you become almost like a tyrant. Right. I, I refuse to be that. I, I want to listen to any, everyone's opinion. Great. That's awesome. Um, you know, we see a lot in the media. We'll even see, I don't know if you remember, on CNN, um, you would have people, once they start talking about a certain topic, they just get cut off. And, and they lose signal. It even happened to Bernie Sanders one time. Oh, because, okay, a lot of those interviews are done by contract. You know that. Yeah. Whereas, like, the contract of the interview is put together a week in advance or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And th what they're allowed to discuss is in the terms and conditions of the contract. Mm -hmm. And if they're violated, then there's penalties ensue, whatnot. And so that's why you see cutoffs or whatnot like that. And the media Someone like controls me, the narrative. Right, then. yeah. I, when I'm up there, I, I, I don't care what questions you ask me. Like, mm -hmm. I'll answer questions that I know will upset you. And the answers I give you will upset you. Right. And that's okay. Libertarianism upsets certain people because it's new. It's like it's like 1776. It's not new. Exactly. You hit the nail yes. on the head. Yep. The framers of our Constitution, as my speech, yesterday my speech at the Governor's Mansion was all about, uh, the theme of it was, uh, was it New Jersey? The best Marines come from New Jersey was the theme of it. Mm. And I pointed out the fact that a third of the initial Marine Corps came from New Jersey. And we talked about how the Marine Corps fought for libertarian values. Right. The original Marine Corps, this. the framers of the Constitution, all fought for libertarian values. They wanted smaller government. The they wanted less especially. Right. Less right. taxes. So, and like, we've come full circle from there. Oh, yeah. We have come full circle. To, to think about what these men did. Now, we've lost all their names to history. All these Marines that served in, in, in the, uh, the Battle of Trenton, the Battle of Princeton, the Battle of Essenpink. Okay? We've lost their names because the records were, were gone. But think about it. Think of some like 18, 19 year old kid, maybe from Camden, had an opportunity to maybe join the Marine Corps. Now, why in heaven's name? Would an 18-year-old in 1775 want to join the Marine Corps? You're from a poor country, and you're going to go and fight a superpower? Now, all right, what drove them was one word, liberty. That's what the Libertarian Party is all about. We want to bring more liberty. And what, what you said, libertarianism is not new. Mm -hmm. It's old. It's just a resurgence. Exactly. It's like when you think of style, like this jacket. Right. It's pretty old. You know, <laughs> a couple years ago it was out of style, but it comes back in. Right. See, back in 1776, and you know, before then, of course, um, this whole idea of liberty and libertarianism had actually been new. No nowhere in the world, really. I believe there was one nation before us that nobody talks about that actually did free themselves from a monarchy, but that was about it. And only a small percentage of the settlers in America actually supported the revolution at first. Most of them were loyalists. About 8%. Right, 8% is the number I was thinking. I wasn't sure, though. 8% mm -hmm. initially supported it. And look what we did. Look where we are. And, the, and, and now look where we are, because we're right back to that monarchy. In fact, it's worse, because if you look at the taxes that the king was levying on us, I wish they would tax us like an extra, what, 1%? Right, right. And we get if pissed you, off over that. If you think about, right, the, the taxation they went to war over yeah. is a lot less than what we're enduring right now. They're taking away like half of the money we make, at least, because the, you have your income taxes and then every other tax... And it's ridiculous. You're right. It's it's more than fi it's about fifty one percent. The average person is paying in mm -hmm. taxes. Which is why can't I keep my money? I don't understand. If I earned this money, I, I remember I was working at Target, and they would give me like forty hours a week, paying ten dollars an hour. Awesome, loved it. And I'm ex I'm expecting to make like a lot of money there. And I look at my paycheck. I'm like, what is this five hundred dollars? Like I just worked. And this is two weeks, so five hundred dollars over two weeks. I'm like, why is all of this taken out? And like, I can only imagine the higher tax brackets what they have to go through. Right. Like, what does Donald Trump pay in taxes? You know? <laughs> well, you know, Donald Trump should love me because under my tax plan, he'll pay a lot less taxes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does. He does support a lot of the libertarian groups. The the answer to your question is this: is that um, we've grown out of control because every single organization in the history of mankind, no matter how well intended it was started out to be becomes corrupt over time. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. Right. right. Let's look at like the Republican Party. When it first started out, they were abolitionists. They wanted to get, do us away with slavery. 
But let's look at where they're at now. They're big on taxation. They're big on big government, right? They're they're war hawks, okay? Even though they claim not to be. Right, right. right. Okay. Look where they're at, okay? The Democratic Party. They um, used to be non-interventionist, and they too now are the war hogs as well. Right. That's it's the one thing they can agree on. Not just political parties, mm-hmm. okay? Let's look at the Catholic Church. Yeah. I'm Catholic, okay? Mm-hmm. Disclaimer here, I'm Catholic. I go to church very often. I go to church for my sacraments. That's about it. But the Catholic Church... It started out with the best of intentions. Right. You, there's no better intention to set up an institution whose basis was love and forgive. That's what Jesus said. You only have two, two, two requirements, love and forgive. Mm-hmm. Okay. Through time, things got pretty messed up. You had the Crusades. Okay. Yep. Well, I mean, then war- again, those were in, re- in, like, in all fairness, I'm not Catholic, I'm actually Protestant, but in all fairness, the Crusades were a response to basically... Islam doing the same thing to the Catholics, okay. and then the Catholics re- retaliated with that. But nobody wants to talk about what preceded it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, I I uh, I believe the same thing. Like I learned in history class about the Crusades and how bad the Catholic Church was about it. Then I actually read the history, and I'm like, wait a second, hold on. This was they had to gain back their land. Their their land was taken from them. Their people were killed. So. Yeah. Okay. We. Yeah. Uh, I'll see the argument there. Yeah. But go fast forward to our current time. Oh. L- let's pedophilia? look. Pedophilia. That's my, where I'm going with mm-hmm. this, okay? With this whole pedophilia scandal, right? You would expect the senior levels of, uh, of the church would have these people prosecuted, thrown mm-hmm. out of their church. They hid them. Uh huh. They hid them. That's why Benedict left. It had nothing to do with being sick. Like he, it was a black blackmail operation, and that's why you have Pope Francis, the Jesuit over here now, uh, as the first openly Jesuit pope, and his deputy pope just got arrested for having a whole ring of uh, like a pedophile ring. This is his deputy deputy pope. If Pope Francis didn't know about this, it's tough. Come on. Okay, I I don't know the top level politics of the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. I don't know his deputy pope where he come from. Mm-hmm. If he came from the same country. If they have a, a, a relationship together, how well he knew him. Right. You know, anything could happen. But uh, uh, my other point is this: like I was going to talk about the um, the former Archbishop of Newark. Mm-hmm. Okay, the former Archbishop of Newark recently retired. Now, when he retired, he took millions of dollars from the archdiocese and built himself a retirement castle. The mission of the Catholic Church is not to build a castle for an archbishop. Mm -hmm. It is to feed and clothe the homeless, to help people. When I saw that, Mm -hmm. I became enraged. Like Now I'm at the point now where I don't donate to the Catholic Church anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I donate where I can. But I just, uh, like, if I go to church, they ask for, for, for donations. I give enough money to help keep the church that I'm at the lights on. Right? I believe in the sacraments. I do. Mm-hmm. But I don't have a whole lot of faith in the politics of the Catholic Church. Right. So my point is yeah. this. Getting back to what I was talking before, every organization in the history of mankind becomes corrupt over time, including governments. Yes. Right? And this is actually what it, the Catholic Church became a government with the, pa- uh, the papacy, papacy, however you pronounce it. And uh, today, a big issue... For um, the Catholic Church and Pope Francis, he supports a um, a carbon tax. What's your opinion on that? I would imagine not not a fan, but I uh, need to yeah. look at that a little bit more before I decide. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, but it uh, it sounds like another fiat currency, really. When you start dreaming about like the the, the carbon taxes I was talking about uh, that I'm familiar with, or that they create credit systems where mm-hmm. you can you know put out X amount, you could sell those credits back and forth. Uh, I'm worried it'd become another like whole currency that's traded. That I you know right. I just would like to reserve okay. to make com- reserve time to make comment on that. That's one. fine. Um, on that topic, big thing with uh, Ron Paul. I'm sure you're a fan of Ron Paul. I heard about it this morning. What? Oh, Rand Paul. Rand Paul. Yes, okay. Rand Paul, his son, got attacked in his home, got blindsided, right. Ron Paul's his father, mm-hmm. big, not a founder of the libertarian movement, but he's one of the biggest propagators. Big motivator, yes. Yes. He was on campus at uh, Rutgers Newark, I think, like last year or so. Really? So. Wow, I love that guy. Yeah, it, uh, it was interesting. He did, mm-hmm. um, Young Americans for Liberty did, uh, they hosted him at an event last year. Wow. At, at Rutgers New Brunswick. And the room was filled with probably a thousand people. That's great. Like people from my age, we students, whatnot. And after the event was over, he gave one of his, his normal speeches or so. It's like nothing that he wouldn't normally not say, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And it was nice. He went up for about half an hour and afterwards he did a selfie with everybody. Oh, every single nice. place. There was like a thousand people that got in line to take a picture of him. And he took the time to take a picture of everyone. That's awesome. See that's that's what we need because the Libertarian Party is just like that. It's not it's for the people it's basically, as Austin Peterson said, we want to take over the world and leave everyone the heck alone. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Austin. <laughs> you hear us.
<laughs> and uh, I'm actually hoping to get him on the show too. See see what happens. But um, where I was going with that is he and a lot of others talk about auditing or even abolishing the Federal Reserve, which as great idea. Know, I agree. Now, a lot of people I know say, Peter, that is retarded. So please explain why that's a good idea. No, uh, the federal government is the only government that with the only government that can print money, mm-hmm. right? And things have gone out of control right now. The dollar used to be pegged to gold up until the Nixon only, Nixon only year. It was like 71, 72, 73. Mm-hmm. I don't know when he took us off the gold standard. But prior to that, every single dollar was backed by gold. And after we came off the gold standard, we went towards this fiat currency system. Now, it's all based upon right now what's called 10% fractional banking. And it's really kind of insane. This dollar that they print, it can be printed up at will. Now, I, mean, I don't know. It's nothing. It's just a little piece of it's paper. It's just now. paper. It's not backed by anything. Yep. All right? And this is what causes inflation. If you look at the dollar versus Bitcoin right now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, Bitcoin. I, I can turn really, that up too. My, my son, Peter John, is 13 years old. And he every day he opens up his phone and says, Dad, you know, it's worth $100 now. Like, yep. like when I first bought it a couple years ago, it was maybe like $300. Yeah. It's like $7,000 right oh, now. Oh, yeah. If you bought like only if like what, like 100 shares of Bitcoin when it first came out, today you'd be, you'd be a millionaire. multimillionaire. Yeah. It's great. Yep. Uh, the reason why is because Bitcoin, it has an end supply. There's mm-hmm. only going to be, I think, 6 million Bitcoins ever produced, right. right? Just by the algorithm. Gold used to be like that. It used to be based on a finite supply of gold. Right. Because we it's a non-renewable oh, I'm sorry, the dollar resource. Was. Yes. So like, the Fed has really screwed things up with their fractional banking, uh, 10% fractional reserve banking, with taking us off the gold standard. Um, why not have the individual states being able to print their own currency? Why not? Why not move towards something like Bitcoin? Mm-hmm. Bitcoin would be, a, I think it's great because like, you don't need a central bank. The central bank exists in cyberspace. Right. Like Every single transaction that occurs on a Bitcoin transaction, if we you, you do a transaction or whatnot, everything is recorded. But the best part of it is only you and I know the addresses of the sender and the receiver. Right. So, like, we ever get pulled in a court, I can actually prove that we're, there was a payment made, right? But also third parties can never intrude and figure out wh- who else is doing things. Right, and right. that's big. Oh, I love that. That's huge. Like, with um, Edward Snowden, what he exposed, like, other whistle- whistleblowers, how the government is spying on us at all times. And libertarians are at the cutting edge of what... People always want to call conspiracy theories until 10, 20 Oh, I love later. a good conspiracy theory. It's, it, 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 <laughs> conspiracy theory becomes just regular facts. You want to hear the best consu- conspiracy theory? Or, or, um, the best conspiracy theory mm-hmm. that I heard this year yeah. was that I was being funded by Phil Murphy's campaign. Really? <laughs> what, to take votes away from Kim Guadano? Is, yeah. that, is that it? Yes. Oh, my I heard that a few times. And I heard the same thing, too. It's like somebody said about uh, Matt Riccardi, too. He's, Matt, he's another independent mm-hmm. in the race. Yeah. Somebody said the same thing about him. Like, I, I left. I was like, there's, there's absolutely no way. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No. That was reaching. No. Yeah. But, I mean, there are there, there have been a good amount of uh, conspiracy theories, to be fair, that have actually turned out to be true. Um, a lot of the false flags that we've had. Gulf of Tonkin, for example. Never happened. What did it do? It got us into the Vietnam War. Uh, Pearl Harbor. I talk it about the first one. The first one that I know of was mm-hmm. the, the Spanish-American War, the, mm-hmm. uh, when the USS Maine was right. sunk in 1898 in right. Havana Harbor. Yep. Right? That was the first one. That was motivated by for like, two primary reasons that I think. Mm-hmm. Right, Hearst, who wanted to sell more newspapers, mm-hmm. and um, Roosevelt, that really wanted to go to war. Exactly. Like, he needed a war to, to make himself— That's why he was president. Yep. He became the war hero. And then you have 9-11. Which I don't know your opinion on it. I know a lot. Of, there's a big consensus in actually both Republican and Democrat parties. A lot, like pretty much everyone believes that there was some, at least some kind of government knowledge or involvement. Uh, would you make an op- like a statement on that, or would you rather not have, say anything on record? I don't know. You don't know. Okay, this here's the thing. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to blindly believe the mm-hmm. official narrative. Yeah. Okay. Because but I mean, I've I've seen yeah. people present evidence. Right. That's questionable. Like look at Building Seven. Right. What happened there? Yeah, and, and you know what? The towers, one and two, and seven, are the only three in history, the only three buildings. That fell perfectly vertical. And on top of that, that fell due to fire. Have you seen all over the world? I'm a firefighter, or I yeah. used to, I used to yeah. be a volunteer firefighter. Okay, they don't I've seen fall. lots of pictures of mm-hmm. buildings that collapse. They don't fall like that. They the kind of fall in. firefighters are the biggest 9-11 truthers. By far, because they they have firsthand experience with this. Physicists, chemists, they well, all know. Also, too, like b- most of the buildings that I I've seen mm-hmm. pictures of that were collapsed, they weren't high rises. Okay, right. so, high so rises. Like, I would like to make make that clear that like I am not a structural engineer. I don't know right. how that stuff works, but right. uh, when it comes to nine eleven, I will not 
blindly believe mm-hmm. the official narrative. Right. And I've seen some evidence from people from the other side saying it was a government job to get us into the war. Right. Like, if you there look at... There so many reasons. Like, the, the, uh, the Patriot Act was already written before 9-11 came out, and then it was just... Is that true? Yeah, it was already written before 9-11, and then they just snuck it in. Nobody nobody questioned it, even though it was in total violation of really? the Fourth Amendment. Look it up. Be- after this is over, I'd like you to send me that information. Yes. Because I, I would like to it's read about that. It's crazy. The, the whole 9-11 thing is big for me. Cause, you I mean, mean, we call it the Unpatriot Act. Yeah, I call it the Unpatriot <laughs> Act, too. I love it. I love it. You know, and you had, you know, Pearl Harbor, where FDR had information. Do we know 100% about the whole Pearl Harbor thing? No. We know FDR wanted us in that war. He wanted it, you know, yeah. 100%. Because, he, you know what? He was a tyrant. Like, everything FDR did, I don't know why both Republicans and Democrats love FDR so much. Because if you support the Constitution, like the president wh- and pretty much any elected official, they have to swear to protect the Constitution. He was the most anti-constitutional president we've ever had. Even Lincoln, while he, what he did with the Emancip- Emancipation Pro- Proclamation was good, although it didn't technically free anybody, uh, he was a big tyrant too. I mean, he violated habeas corpus. So Andrew Jackson as well. So some of the best presidents we've had really... Quote. Quote. Best, yeah. best, you know, <laughs> if you're going to look at a libertarian value, which is what we were founded upon, we're not exactly the best. But I would love to see someone like you in as governor taking over the state, leaving everybody well, alone. If, if I were elected governor of mm-hmm. New Jersey, we could change the entire world. Now, I'll, I'll make this statement perfectly clear. I am never running for president. Okay? <laughs> I am never okay. running for president. Uh. But if I were elected governor of New Jersey, in a matter of a week... I could turn this state around Mm -hmm. and provide leadership for the rest of the country, if not the rest of the world, how to run a government. Like Mm -hmm. under my tax plan, let's look at it. New Jersey's last when it comes to taxation problems. It's last when it comes to economics in 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 the entire country. If you implement my plan, there's no more property tax. There's no more corporate taxes. Now, Let's well, that's look at huge. Do you know how many businesses would come into oh, this state? The, the entire world would be beating down a door to set up business. We would have to put up walls around New Jersey right. to prevent businesses from coming yeah, in. It'd be amazing. The amount of competition, free market would be the the prices would go down, the wages would go up because that's just how free market works. It affects the works. drug war too. The drug war. Let's talk about that. That's a huge thing. When I I one day plan on running for office as well. Bam. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to help with this because I visited a jail, okay? In Mom jail or prison? Monmouth County? Okay. Uh, Monmouth County Jail. Yeah, it was Monmouth County Jail. And um, there's 13% um, African Americans in Monmouth County. Like everyone was African American or Hispanic in that jail. And I'm wondering. And I'm wondering why. Because if you look at the urban communities, and this, is, this was actually very much uh, planned in the whole welfare state, but we could talk about that in a second. But if you look at the war on drugs, it disproportionately affects the african-americans and, the, and people who live in urban communities the cia like literally like not even classified it's declassified put drugs into the urban communities spread around and now we have over 80 over 80 percent of all people who are in jail for drug use is marijuana it's not that bad of a drug everyone i know does it i mean they're okay i'm telling you remember gary johnson in the debate where he faked that heart attack i was laughing so what do you what do you think? What what would you do drug wise? What could you do? Like even the state law, twenty one years old to smoke. It's, in my opinion, I think it's crazy. It, okay, we can talk about age majority too. Let's start, we'll go back to drug war first. Mm-hmm. All right, when it comes to the war on drugs. Okay, here's my public service service message. Everybody out there, do not do drugs. Okay, they're bad for you. Agreed. But agreed. But w- drugs being illegal is worse than them being legal. Right. They are now. Talking about what you said, you, you just pretty much led me into this whole thing. I agree with you wholeheartedly. The drug war needs to end. Let's look at the people that are injured by it. Like you just named the biggest mm-hmm. demographic of people that are harmed by it, the people that are incarcerated for having a medical issue. Let's say you're addicted to heroin, even marijuana, you mm-hmm. can become addicted to that. Right. You're addicted to these controlled substances. Are you a criminal? No. Really? It's an illness. It's an illness. And, and you don't I belong love, in prison. Do you remember, I believe it was, and I, don't quote me on this. Well, I mean, I'm on air. But uh, you remember the guy who died, the libertarian, who died um, during the race? Uh, oh, Dr. Feldman. Yes, Feldman. I yeah. believe it was him who said that, uh, and I could be wrong, but he said that. He was awesome. The cri- <laughs> Oh, do you remember that speech he made? I, all right, let's. The rap on. speech? Yes, that's <laughs> amazing. He said that the, the punishment that you pay for doing drugs is the effect it has on your body. That, to me, 
boom, brilliant, blew yeah, you, my mind. You don't, it's, it's, uh, John McAfee said you because he was a former Maybe it was addict. Him who said it. Yeah, uh, John McAfee, he was a former addict, and he said mm-hmm. you do not have to punish people that are addicted to drugs. Yeah. The addiction is already the punishment. Yeah, what right. what are you doing? You're taking them out of society, so when they come back into society, they can't function anyways. Go, right. where in they have a prison right record, right? Oh, they yeah. can't get a job, right? Mm-hmm. And their confidence is low. And what happens is, yep, they tie up another vein, right? Yep. That's exactly how it works. Exactly. So, and my opinion is this, that this drug war needs to end. Now, we just talked about the number one group of people that are injured by are the people that are incarcerated, prosecuted, or forced to turn over on dangerous drug dealers. That's the number one. The second biggest demographic group of people that are harmed by this war on drugs is... Who is it? The police. Really? Yeah. Think about this. Okay. Police officers are put in the middle. Every time... Now, I'll I'll give you a scenario uh, example here. In January, Mm -hmm. I was pulled over twice. Almost identical situation. Slightly speeding. One was I was actually parked in a, in, a, in a park eating my lunch or whatever. And there were two white officers. Now, they're not rookies. Been on a job for a little while. About early 30s or so, you could see. And uh, they had some experience. As they walk up to my vehicle, not really walking, the shuffle step, turned away with their weapon on the opposite hip. Right. And their hand is in close proximity of their weapon. Right. And they position themselves in a way that give them the biggest advantage in case something goes down. Right. And the look in their eye, as they look me in the eye, is absolute paranoia, and they're scared to death. I wonder why. Okay. I mean, look okay. at what we're dealing right. with right this, now. The point is this. Now, when police officers do 10, 12, 15 pullovers a day, right, and if there's somebody in a car who is addicted to marijuana or heroin, they have a small trace amount in that car, at least 10% of them will exercise violence to get away from that yeah. situation. Some will just say, okay, search my car and they'll be arrested. Some will speed off and run. Mm-hmm. But 10% will use violence. Yep. And a lot of times that winds up in an officer getting hurt, killed, or the person that had the, 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 the substance, them getting hurt or killed. And it's just a bad situation. Yep. Now, getting back to what I was saying before about police officers being injured by this war on drugs, yeah, they are. Every single sure. pol- every single street police officer is suffering from PTSD because it's a stupid war on drugs. Yep. This, We've been fighting it since the 1930s. When the war on alcohol ended, we had this tremendous standing army ready to make war on its own people but had no no enemy. Oh, okay, let's go to war against marijuana, and they've right. been doing it since then. And look what happened. You, you, you ban... Uh, the alcohol, right? And then what happens? You get people like Al Capone. It, it just be- creates more crime. You ban drugs. You, if you legalize drugs, guess what happens? Wh- wh- what are they going to sell the the gangs? They can't. They can't. They're done. Gangs are out of business. The, but that's what that's the thing. They want to control. Mexican cartels us. are out of business. They are gone. You know, Trump wants to say how Mexico is bringing in a lot of drugs to us. Guess what? They're bringing in drugs because they're illegal. Right. And they want to ban guns. Okay, ban guns. And I sw- I know people, because this is Camden, it, like guns are practically illegal over here. It's a big city. Uh, they all have guns. It's yeah. illegal. You only get it from Only gangs. the bad guys have guns. Yes. Only, only If you ban guns, only the people who have disre- disregard for the law, bad guys, have guns. Leaving people like me and you unprotected, which I don't feel comfortable with. So I'm not I- allowed to have a gun here, but I do carry a knife when I'm not in somewhere that I'm not allowed to carry a knife. You know, like, for example, City Hall. Mm -hmm. When I'm in City Hall, you can't have a knife, so. Or on campus. If I'm elected, I'm the most pro-Second Amendment candidate in the race. Mm -hmm. And ironically, I I did a debate, I guess, about about a month or so ago. uh, Maybe two months ago. It was at a uh, NJ SafeCon or whatever. It's a a gun show without guns kind of thing. Right. And um, I am by far the most pro-Second Amendment candidate in the race. If I am elected governor, on Inauguration Day, I'll be issuing mass pardon and clemency for... Every single person in New Jersey, freeing them of all these draconian New Jersey gun laws. Good. You will have concealed carry. We'll do away with magazine restrictions, weapon types. We will default to the federal standard, mm-hmm. just like Vermont. Vermont only. There's very few laws in Vermont statewide when it comes to firearms. They they default towards the federal standard. Right. All right. Vermont's a very pleasant state. You ever been there? People go there, go yeah, skiing. I went there one time. It's yeah, it's it's beautiful. I believe that's People Sanders very country, respectful. Though. It's a great place to be right. in. You know why? Because like um, at any time, you know, people have could have a, a, a firearm on their person. If like you know, if you get a road rage incident, you know, it could go bad pretty quick. Whatever. Yep. Like, but anyway, but they have like in, in certain areas, like up in the mountains. I remember um, actually, my family was considering moving into the mountains years ago, and they told us into Vermont. 
Uh, or Skyland to New Jersey? I believe it was in New Jersey or New York. We used to live in New York. And <coughs> um, they, they, they told us that the police re like response time is about 45 minutes. So if something goes down, carry a gun. That's what everyone does. And you know what? The mountains are a pretty safe place to live because mm -hmm. everyone's carrying guns. I mean, if you look at it, the amount of guns that we are owning as a country have been rising always, and the crime rate has been getting lower. And if you look in gun-free zones, if someone were to attempt a mass shooting, on average, they kill 14 people before they're stopped by police. But if there's a responsible citizen with a gun, only on average, two people are killed. That's 12 people's lives. That is me, my entire immediate family, my aunts and uncles, all their lives saved. You know, that's you. I got to remember those statistics. Huh? I have to remember those statistics. Oh, I remember them because of how many times I have to repeat them in debates. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, I, I, getting back to um, me being the most pro Second Amendment candidate in the race, many people in the Second Amendment community still will not vote for me. And here's yeah. why. They, um, the NRA leadership, they continue to tell people to vote Republican. Yeah. Okay, Kim Godano. establishment. Kim Godano is no friend to the NRA. The NRA has given her an A rating. Come on. There's no way she's an A rated candidate. They wouldn't even send me one of the questionnaires. They won't rate me. Okay. They'll send one to the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And I, I called out the NRA, ILA, whatever, at this at the state convention uh, right. a few months ago. Like, oh, uh, well, it's expensive. Like, you can't put 45 cent stamp well, on it. They're in like, bed with the Republican yeah, Party. That's what it is. Let's not say. Let's also look yeah. at, like, where it's at, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Imagine. If you're a lobbyist or a lawyer making $200,000 a year working for the NRA, now, what happens in New Jersey if all of a sudden I'm governor and I give everybody they want? What happens to the NRA? They have nothing to lobby for. Exactly! Right? right? All of a sudden, these jobs vanish. So they need this the is controlled why opposition. They can't stand me because I'm the biggest threat to the NRA. Because the NRA's existence right now in New Jersey... Listen up, Democrats. Okay. You don't like the MR <laughs> NRA? Here you go. Yeah, Democrats, you don't like the NRA? Get me elected. Let's okay? go. <laughs> Like the NRA, the New Jersey Second Amendment Society, all, all these societies, they, they don't like me much because if I'm elected, I end the war. Right. Well, right. This, is the, this is the NRA leadership. Let's not talk about like, like NRA, the, uh, your average member of the NRA, there's a lot of uh, pa patriots, veterans, I mean, regular people who support individual liberty. The, this is your average NRA member. I plan on actually becoming a member of the NRA because I do support the Second Amendment and everything. But I, I support your platform entirely. Like, I believe that go to the federal standard. For federal guns, standard, good 100%. enough. But at the top, that's where you get it all politicized because they're embedded with the Republicans. you got mutual funding there. you got the Koch brothers, Coach brothers, however you pronounce it, mm. in bed with everybody. And you got, you know, Goldman Sachs and, and, and banks like that. Mm -hmm. And they're all controlled by the same people. Even the Republicans and the Democrats at the top are controlled and funded by the same people. Yeah, w as, a, as a party... The Libertarian Party best represents the gun owner everywhere in the country, including, including New Jersey. But uh, And we've pretty much given up in New Jersey trying to make a relationship with the NRA mm -hmm. uh, it, because of what you just said. It's very difficult. They're already in bed with the Republican Party, and it just works well with them. Um, we tried. I will never close on a door if they ever want to discuss things with us. Great. You know, I'll, I'll show up at any event I can to help enlighten people. Say, hey, you know, there is another choice. OK, yeah. you don't have to vote for somebody is by holding your nose. You can vote for somebody that really represents you. Right. And I think at that at that, uh, that convention was at a couple months ago. I did pick up a fair amount of votes. Mm -hmm. There were plenty of people there that are, are angry with what the NRA was doing or not doing. They were angry with what the NJ2S was doing. A lot of infight between two like NJ2S and the NRA. They're like. They are two organizations that say they're uh, for the same thing, and they fight like cats and dogs. Right. It's sort of like they, they had like a split little revolution. Like they really it's need politicized. Yeah. It's, I want they, control. No, I want control. Yeah. But they want the same thing. It would be nice but if they came together and actually, you know. Right. Yeah. Because like, right. they're the two biggest powerhouses when it comes to uh, publicly advocating for the gun owner. Right. All right. Other than the Libertarian Party. Right. Of course. So uh, here's a fun little part of this interview that I had planned. It's it's going to probably be my favorite part. Actually, I, I've... All right, get it thing. in, because I, I get another interview coming up. Right. All right. Let's end it with this. I have three statements for you. Uh, oh, wait, last thing we'll talk about. Sure, sure. Okay, this is a college radio show. Okay. All right. I'm also big on reducing the age majority. Okay. When it comes to uh, drinking, mm -hmm. smoking, gambling in Atlantic City, that should be reduced to the age of 18. Right. They do it anyway. Right. Okay. <laughs> Good point. They do it anyway, right? But 
Now, if they do it, now they're not going to get prosecuted for it. Right, because right. then you ruin someone's whole life. Right. It, you ruin their whole life. If I'm elected governor on Inauguration Day, there's going to be another mass pardon all for that kind of stuff. Thank God. Because it, it's it's stupid. Like, if, like, it is the biggest insult in the world to young voters to tell them, yeah, you can go overseas and get your head shot off for you. But, like, no, you're not responsible enough to have a drink. You can't have a smoke. Right. Can't go to Atlantic City and gamble. Ridiculous. Yeah. Right. Absolutely right. ridiculous. Get rid of that. So, three three statements. Uh, popular within the Libertarian Party. Just want your 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 take, your opinion, your comment on it. Number one, tax- taxation is theft. <laughs> it makes a great meme. It right? does. All right, it does. It that that one is put out by pretty much by the anarchic side of mm-hmm. the party or so. But even like Ron Paul. I you know I'm, I would say I'm guilty. I've used that meme plenty of times. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Because I, I mean, you it. are taking someone's money without consent. Right. So I mean, by definition, by gunpoint, it's say, it's taxation gunpoint, yeah. is a violation of the non-aggression principle. When right. you think about it, the like, NAP. Yep. Right. When you hold a gun to somebody's head and say, "Give me," mm-hmm. that violates the principle. So therefore, right. taxation is theft. Right. Now I I like your platform because even though it doesn't get rid of all taxes, because I mean. I'm really running for governor, can't. right? You can't do that. No, I, I'm running for governor of right. New Jersey. And for me right. to ask the people of New Jersey to totally abandon the way they've been doing things for the past 150 right. years and just go cold turkey yeah. towards it's not uh, libertarianism, work right now. absolutely yeah. not. Like when you look at my school choice program, my school choice program is a pragmatic step towards privatization of schools. Right. Which and is, I support 100%. Okay. Like, I don't believe that schools should be run by the government because mm-hmm. they don't they're not schools they become government conditioning programs. Yes, propaganda. So, exactly. So I come up with a, a plan to halfway step forward to help start moving towards privatization of schools, right. right? To get people acclimated to it. Like when it comes to war on drugs, I don't have the power to end the entire war on drugs, but right. you know what I can do is I can at least take steps to legalize marijuana, right? right. And when it's legal when I if I had the chance to legalize marijuana, very I'd soon in this in this state. We'll see, yeah, yeah. But like, let's look at the taxation of it too. Do we really need to tax it? Please, the government has enough money. Mm-hmm. It's like giving it's like giving a beer to an alcoholic. Yeah. Right. The government is irresponsible enough when it comes to money. So management. much spending. How about lower the spending and you won't need as much taxes? How about fiscal democracy? Yeah, ding, exactly. Ding, ding. But with your money, <laughs> flat tax. Let them choose where it goes. What the people don't want to fund, they won't fund. You know, regarding the federal government, of course, you have a lot of you know trillions of dollars that just vanish, and those go into God knows where. Yeah, all kinds but of like ghost programs. Oh and yeah, Pentagon. But, um, all right, next one. I want my gay married couples to defend their weed farms with fully automatic machine guns. I love that one. The first time I heard that was Austin Peterson. Yeah, I I love that one too. Yeah, it, it, because it, it it it's a short statement that describes the entire platform mm-hmm. like the average person on the street would like well they might hear and say oh my goodness they're crazy right like, no we're not crazy that, see that's part of one of my jobs as being the the nominee for the libertarian party for governor is to be an emissary of the party and we always tell each other whenever you go out in, in public and you meet people you're probably the first libertarian they're ever gonna meet right that's true right and like, even though it's so fast growing but there's a reason why it's fast growing because when you tell people about it, that you may be the first person that they meet that believes this way, but they're gonna be like, "Hey, that that sounds right," you know. So yeah, like like you're saying. Yeah, it's uh, Austin summed it up nicely. Love that guy. But we all have a job to do to grow this party. Mm-hmm. We need to get people elected. Hopefully, I'll be elected this year and on I Tuesday. Hope so too. That would be great. Uh, we we officially sup- um, endorse. Uh, Peter Rohrman, oh, awesome. or governor, <laughs> just letting you know. All right, so this is an opinion show. Okay, good. All right. Oh yeah, yeah. This is, I'm, I'm a, everyone's gonna know I'm a libertarian, but <laughs> I will be having some arguments with people. I, I uh, plan on having um, the director of the Freeholders of Camden on because he wrote an article in the newspaper I work for, totally talking about gun control and saying that it's as easy as buying a gallon of milk to buy a gun. I'm just going to ask him when's the last time he passed the background check and had a wait period, you know, to buy a gallon of milk. I can bring you that. I can send I'm you a I'm 47 years old. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I own a few guns. Yeah. Whatever. Like whenever I want to go purchase a gun, I can tell you it takes a while. There's yeah. a long process. Yeah. It's, it, it's so ridiculous. I saw another thing on uh, BuzzFeed, another stupid. And it's talking about it's, it, it's easier to get a driver's license than it is to get a gun. Really? Because don't you need a driver's license or some form of ID to get a gun? <laughs> That's a good debate point. <laughs> right? I, I just, it, it blows my mind. So the final statement here is uh, said by kind of an infamous but also famous uh, radio talk show host. Very big supporter of the Libertarian Party. Huge Trump supporter, Alex Jones. 
Oh, Alex. Do you like him? <laughs> I love him. Hey, it's interesting. I, he's, I'll he's be honest with you. I, I yeah. used to listen to him about once a week or so yeah. until he started supporting Trump. Yeah. When it, when he started supporting Trump, I stopped listening to the show. I, it, I it was supported say, Trump I, because I didn't like Gary Johnson. I just I, didn't like him. Yeah, I didn't like Gary Johnson either. Yeah. Um, but, like, I held my nose and I voted for him, yeah. honestly. You um, did? I See, did. I, I just voted for Trump because, you know what? Well, I didn't vote for Trump. I, I told everyone to vote for Trump because I wasn't legal to vote, you know, and I'm not a Democrat, so they won't let me be or an illegal immigrant. It's understandable. <laughs> like, yeah. Trump's election, I, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, yeah. but Trump's election policy, me neither. was a referendum on the entire system. Mm -hmm. Here's a person who never was in politics before, and people are sick and tired of these career politicians right. rising to the top and continuing to rob from them. Right. So right, they're sending a message. So now, yeah. maybe this is a lead in to like maybe me being elected That's this year. That's my point. That's why I voted for my state. I said if Trump gets elected in 2016, I think in 2020, we can have a, a libertarian because now the Republican establishment has been destroyed because the people, the guy who they tried to fix as the candidate didn't win. They did everything they could to stop Trump. They couldn't because the people supported him. And then they tried, the DNC tried to rig the election against Bernie and they succeeded actually, but they couldn't even get Hillary in as president. But his statement that I want your opinion on is the answer to 1984 is 1776. <laughs> yeah, that's been his tagline for a very yep. long time. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, he's, he's, he's right in that. Yeah. Absolutely right. Have you um, read the book 1984, George Orwell? George Orwell? Oh, probably back in high school. Yeah. You're talking like 20, almost 30 years yeah. ago, right? Um, no, I can't remember too much of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, a lot of things, though. Like they had uh, telescreens, basically. Like you know how your your Samsung, they proved that they can actually watch you through your uh, your camera on the Samsung, and they listen to you. Even your phones now. If I say OK Google. On my phone, it's gonna say, "Hey, what do you what do you want?" You yeah. know? but that means it's listening to everything. Everything I you say, say. Yep. waiting for me to say, "Okay, Google." It's all stored in Utah, baby. Oh yeah. Mhm. Mm Every bit of it. I we we need to promote not that. <laughs> yeah, that's why like when John McAfee comes out, here's a plug for his product. Uh -huh. John McAfee's working on a a new cell phone or so that has actual, I heard about this. Yeah, has a bunch of hard buttons in it. It's just where you can shut off the camera, shut off the mic, yes. shut off the GPS. You know. So, like, I'm still that. holding on to this BlackBerry until that thing comes to market. Good. <laughs> I can't wait. I'll buy that one all day. Yep. All right. So, that, that concludes the interview. All right, last thing. Okay. Oh, sure, sure. When it comes to 2020, mm -hmm. Libertarian Party uh, for presidential nominations, what do you think? I hear Bill Weld is throwing his hat in. I hear I Gary, wanna, Johnson I is, 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 Gary Johnson is, is already announced that he's going to be running in 2020. Please, no. What about uh, The Rock? I heard about this. I, so, you know, I heard about this from Alex Jones. And on Alex Jones, he was saying, now when I first heard about it, actually, I heard it was on like CNN basically saying how he didn't like Trump and all that kind of stuff. And then on Alex Jones, he's saying that he heard from people who know Dwayne Johnson saying that he actually is a patriot and that he supports libertarianism. We wouldn't have to change our signs from last year. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Johnson. What about? Right, put, put welds on the, uh, you know, let it run. With what welds. about Kurt Russell? Who's that? I've heard the name. Who, who is He's that? a famous actor. He started out uh -huh. as a childhood actor. He's married to Goldie Hawn. Okay. Um, you've probably seen him. What was the last thing? Was it Hateful Eight that he did? Okay. Yeah, this sounds familiar, and I know that movie. Yeah. Okay. It, He's a, a prospect. I guess we got to pull him out though, because right. he always says that he's not political. But yeah. like every once in a while, he slides stuff out there. Maybe nice. To, uh, maybe Clint Eastwood. Oh my gosh! If Clint Eastwood ran, he's a little too old to yeah. run. But like he's another see libertarian. Ron Paul. Ron Paul for for president of the liber. Uh, he's oh, kind of up there in age. He's though. up there in age too. I love to see Rand Paul. He Rand did a great job last year. He did, and you know, he, on uh, Twitter, he has about 1.2 million followers now. He had like a couple, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 thousand before. The libertarian movement is spreading, and it's spreading. Like a cancer. <laughs> yeah, but like a good one. And it's spreading in the Republican Party, too. You don't see it as much in the well, Democrat Party. Honestly, Rand Paul mm -hmm. in the Republican Party is an anomaly. Yes. Okay? Austin Peterson in the Republican Party is an anomaly. Right. Your average libertarian is not going to survive there. Right. Libertarians are not Republicans. Republicans are right-wing. They're, um, they're, they want to push their morals on everyone. Right. We don't really fit in there that well. Mm -hmm. Rand, Austin, they might do okay. They're like Rand has done well in there. Austin, we'll see how he does. I hope he wins. I think he will. I don't know. We'll I don't see how he does. It. But for the most part, we're not welcome there. Right. Right. And on the other side too, it's like we try to like welcome people that come into our party and stuff. But like a lot of times, Republicans that are like disenchanted by their own party, internal party politics, come over to us. And we're telling me, you know, dude, you have to accept the fact that people like to smoke weed, you know, and like, right. like they're out of there, you know, like. Well, you know what though, I, I would disagree with that, 
for one reason i think we need the vote like we need to win we need to win the yeah. election yep. so you if, do not yeah. affect policy by throwing stones from outside right. you have to get elected right so like let whoever i don't care if you're a communist oh yeah I, vote we, libertarian we just give us the vote and we will make this country great again <laughs> because <laughs> 1776 <laughs> was from a constitutional well 1787 <laughs> constitution was ratified 1791 the bill of rights were put in um anti-federalist thank you uh thomas jefferson <laughs> but uh you know let's let's make the country like that again rather than today they're spying on us. They're taking away our guns. I mean, why Why is it the government can have guns? We can't have guns. So we, we can't protect ourselves. Let's, let's imagine for a second, and it's not hard to imagine, we have some kind of Hitlerian uh, ruler, like a lot of people want to say Trump is. All the people who are anti-gun are trying to say that Trump is Hitler. If Trump's Hitler, what did, what did, Trump, uh, what did Hitler do? He took away the guns from the Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, Stalin did it. I mean, yep. to quote to quote Alex Jones, Hitler took the guns, Stalin took the guns, Mao took the guns, Hugo right. Chavez took the guns. The, the you know. Second Amendment is not for duck hunting. Yep. The Second Amendment was instilled as a last ditch effort to save your government. Mm -hmm. Right. It is meant to be a threat. When your government is afraid of you, that's freedom. When you're afraid of your government, that's tyranny. George Washington. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Did you just come up with that? I just yeah. It was, that was. It was either George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. I, I, I know Biden. I've never heard it before. Are but you anyway. serious? Yeah. What? Oh, my God. I want to look this up. I, I'm going to send you later. Uh, okay. I'm going to send it to you. I can't believe you just said that without ever hearing it before because no, that was actually, before. I believe it was George Washington who said that. And that... Maybe I'm reincarnated. That's, <laughs> that's why we have to vote. Peter Rorman. Hey, all of you at Rutgers, all right, you're all old enough to vote now unless you skipped a grade, which congrats to you. But... Uh, Vote, vote, get out there, register to vote, vote for Peter Vorman. I know this. Like my Facebook page. Like his money. Facebook page. Um, like his send me your beer money too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send it. Listen, he needs he needs your contribution. If you don't win this this time around, will you run again next time? This is my third year in a row running. Okay. I'm tired. I, uh, okay. I am. I, I ran for Bergen Freeholder two years in a right. row. It took a lot out of me. This year, I've been up and down the state. Now, I had no intentions of actually running for governor this year, mm -hmm. zero. Um, but what happened was we had we were courting two very high-profile candidates, like great candidates that you would like, oh, my goodness, you got it, like, well, like, like Rand Paul kind of stuff. Right, right. And um, they had both backed out the last minute. A month before our state convention was about like February or so, we had no candidates. And at the time, I was on a state board. We we're looking around each other. It's like, who are we going to run? We started pointing fingers at each other. And people kept coming to excuses why they couldn't run. Right. And I had quite a few people ask me. And I said, Pete, we need you to run. So I answered the call. I said, okay, I'll run. I, but uh, let's understand. It's like, you know, I'm tired from the past two years. And, uh, you know, we'll run pretty much just a paper candidacy and how it goes. We'll just keep the seat warm for the next four years or so. And they're like, they were all in agreement. Notice that a week after I had announced I was running, five people announced that they're going to run. And I think three of them were out from outside the party. Mm -hmm. These were people that wanted to bypass the primaries and they go right to the general. They ran as libertarians? Or yeah, they, they wanted to run as libertarians. Okay. Like, like, we are the only party that runs an actual convention anymore. Right. Like, the Democrats, Republicans, they all do super the, delegates, they, they do the super delegate yep. primary thing. It's, it's all BS. It's, it doesn't yep. promote good candidates yep. or whatever. We're the only party left. I think even the Green Party does theirs by a council. Like, mm -hmm. you know, six guys get to determine who's running for governor. Right. Um, I don't know about them very much. I yeah. just know I'm blocked. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Our party, like we had a convention at Rutgers, we had it in Rutgers, New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. uh, was it some hotel that's on a campus okay. over there? And uh, you, know, you have two hundred people there, and you have delegates, and they have the right to vote. Who is it? it? It's a real convention. People right. scream and yell and want this candidate, that candidate. Nice. So anyway, um, I was then like in a fight to hold on to the party's integrity because now you have you have a couple internal. Uh, candidates that were running, uh, we had some other people from outside the party that wanted to bypass the primary and by our convention rules, anybody that comes in, they can take the nomination if the delegation votes for it. Right. Right. So now I have to keep fighting for it. So like, I, I won on the first ballot and then after that, I had so many volunteers that stepped up. I must have had like 25 volunteers that stepped up the next day and started putting a good effort in. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So like, it no longer was a paper candidacy. Right. It then became a try. real effort. Yeah, so like, so like now, like people were making donations, people walking streets, putting in, you know, stuff in uh, people's mailboxes and whatnot, making Twitter feeds, whatever like that. It's just, it started growing. Like right now, like I'm pretty happy with the campaign we put together. Like we may or may not win this thing, but we held on to our integrity. We spread the message. Right. And like, 
hey, we'll see what kind of impact we have on Tuesday. Right. I, you know, the polls obviously are leaning heavily towards Bill Murphy, but as we were talking before the interviews, the polls really, they don't actually really sample libertarians. They'll sample like 40% or even less Republicans and then mostly Democrats. And that's why Trump beat the odds of the polling because they would oversample Democrats and it turned out, oh yeah, no, he, he's just going to win like 320. Like. Yeah, I, I spoke to uh, yeah. Patrick Murray. He's the one that's mm-hmm. in charge of polling for Monmouth University. They're, they're ones that do it, put out like one of these polls prestigiously right. or whatever. And Patrick looked me in and said, absolutely not, I'm not including you in the polls. I'm like, why not? It's like, people want to know me because I'm not putting you in polls. Just flat out. Really? Just totally Did he give an explanation? Right. Just I said, why not? Because not doing it. You know what? <laughs> it's the, the two parties they wa- they take over the country together, right? Okay, we share. We now have the part that we have the country, Republicans and Democrats, but we're not going to give it to anyone else now. It's just us, and we'll fight amongst each other. So they they fight against people like us, people like you, the little guy, right? The guy who's trying to you know say hello. Let me let me in the polls. Let me in the debates. We if we got into one debate, do you understand the impact that would oh, have? Yeah. If, Everyone if, loves the liberty movement. Everybody. If, if I were in, allowed to participate in the debates this year, I would have blew them out of the water. You when would I, be the front runner right when, now in the media. When I met Phil Murphy for the first and the only time I met him, mm-hmm. it was at, um, in Rutherford, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. It was Labor Day. And um, the big street event. There's probably 25,000 people attending this event, vendors all over the place. And I had my table set up, and he comes walking up the uh, my, my vendor's like area's row. And I position myself in a way where he can't get around me. Right. So like he walks up, he sees me, he says, hi, Pete. We shake hands. Oh, he knew who you were then. Yeah, you know. Oh, nice. So uh, we, sh- we shake hands. I said, you know, uh, Phil, regrettably, because that was right for the deadline. Regrettably, I did not raise enough money to qualify for the debates. And right away, he, he showed some, some true like... Um, like sorrow of the fact that I wasn't in there. So like, Pete, I'm sorry to make it in there. Like, I don't agree with the law. I said, really? Because there's Bill a band shell. I said, there's a band shell right there. And you and I can go up there. We can have a, a quick debate between the two of us with 25,000 people watching. Dude, he couldn't get away from me fast <laughs> enough. Boom. I've got pictures of it. Like somebody at the event was taking pictures of me, shaking his hand and then like taking off. It was like, uh, it was he like, doesn't want it. He no. doesn't want it. And no, you know, can't. we have the facts behind us in the libertarian that's movement. That's what he's like, when you debate from the political and the moral high ground, Okay, I'm not great at the art of debating. I'm not. Um, I'm not a super intelligent guy. You know, I'm just what I know. I know from experience. I don't. You know, I don't have this 160 IQ or whatnot. But that's why you're you have the backing because you have the experience. You can see that this is a green pen. Okay, <laughs> they can play their games, their emotion games. The Republicans and the Democrats will just go based off emotion. Oh, I think it's morally wrong for gays to marry or I think it's morally wrong for people to but That's where people vote. Right. Right. But people, facts don't care about your feelings. Right. To quote Ben Shapiro. Right. Okay. <laughs> We've had this argument in our party quite a few times trying to educate candidates because we are notorious for putting forth candidates that are great, absolutely phenomenal with statistics, with putting things together, but not so good at connecting with people through the heart. Right. And um, we're working on it. Now, maybe one of the reasons, like, I think I'm okay at it. I, I, I'm not great, but I'm okay at connecting with I think you did a great job today, at least. Oh, thanks. Good <laughs> Good speaker. All right. Um, I got to get going. All right. Well, I had a great time. Me too. Great times. Oh, what an honor. I'm late already. Oh, I'm sorry <laughs> about that. All right. Well, thanks to everyone listening. This has been Peter Rohrman, uh, interviewed by Peter Cordy of the Anointed News Journal and WCCR Rutgers Radio. All right. Thank you.